for you to join me in all your ministry. And you may think, well, Jeremiah, I'm not ready. Sweetheart, you're, you're ready. You know, you think, well, I don't know how to relate to these kids. Or I don't know what to say. God will give you what to say. It's a fabulous thing to get out of your comfort zone and sit down. And it's a great day. And it's uh, June. We're going to have it June 4th, 5th, 6th, and 7th is uh, when it's going to be. And as you volunteer for altar ministry, um, I'll help you with it. And we'll have someone come out here and train us on how to do it. But I've been involved for years, and uh, if you would like to be involved in that, just let me know. And uh, you guys can do that. And it's basically just praying with kids and need help, and it's a beautiful thing. So there's that. Uh, throwing that out there. we got Winter Jam, March 15th. Anybody heard of Winter Jam? Yep. We're going to go to Winter Jam. If you want to go, we're going to take a group. And so if you're interested in going to Winter Jam, that's March 15th. It's $10 at the door. It's very inexpensive. Doors open at 5 o'clock. We'll go as a group. Last year we went as a group. We had a great time. We ended up playing tag football while we were in line. It was great. We had a great time. So that's coming up. And June, excuse me, March 15th is when it is. It'll be a Saturday, I think. Okay. And then here's the next thing, real quick, before we jump into what God asked for us this morning. Next Sunday is going to be so different. It's going to be completely different, okay? We're going to have a, a dinner, uh, a communion dinner service. And what that basically means is when you come in, the chairs aren't going to be set up like this. Chairs are going to be set up like it was at the Christmas party. If, you're, if you came to the Christmas party, we're going to have the chairs set up like a dinner table, and I'm going to take the entire service and we're going to teach on communion. And uh, how many know communion is powerful? Because it represents what Jesus did for us. And how many know that a lot of people have taught it very incorrectly? And they've used it to bring fear into people's hearts and to cause them to uh, be sin conscious rather than Jesus conscious. And so we're going to take that entire ser service. And we're going to have dinner together, and we're going to teach on communion, and we're going to have a wonderful time, and it's going to be awesome. But when you come in, it's going to be it's going to be totally different. Things are going to be set up different. So just wanted to let you know it's on the horizon. If and it's not a potluck, so if you're interested, <laughs> if you're interested, I love potluck. There's a time for potluck. There's not a time for potluck. And what we're having is we're going to have roast, and we're going to have uh, 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 bread. And we're going to have salad. And so if you're coming, bring drinks. And if you're interested in bringing salad, uh, see Stacy or Katie. And uh, the roast is taken care of. But if you want to bring some salad, uh, if you want to bring some dessert on the side, see me. No, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm only kind of kidding. Yeah, if I'm real, I am kidding. So. And so anyway, if you're interested in, in helping out with that, see Stacy or Katie. And uh, we'll line out some salad and bring some bread and roast and stuff. Sorry, take care of. So next Sunday, don't make plans for lunch because we're all going to be eating together. It's going to be great. And I've got a really cool surprise for you, too. And I won't give you any information on that other than it's going to be really cool. <laughs> so, any questions or comments? Complaints? Gripes? Rain? It's raining, right? As long as it rains, we're fine. Cool. Office taken up. Father, we ask you to bless it in Jesus' name. Yeah. All right. Let's turn to John 14. Hallelujah. Uh, are we online? Are we good? Hello. We love you. Um, no, the kids are growing up. I'm sorry. I think. Oh, not yet. Not yet. Hold on. Not yet. Um, John 14. And, you know, I've been teaching on peace. And um, I really tried to get off of it. And I tried to teach some y'all. I told you that last Sunday was going to be the last. Uh, I want him to be in control. And I want to preach what he wants to preach. And uh, the reality, did y'all have an opportunity to guard your hearts through the week last week? Yeah. Amen. That's wonderful. I did too. You mean, tell you what, <laughs> I lost my wallet and I got up that day and I couldn't find my wallet. Now, here we go. Now, impacting our lives, then we, there's no reason to be sharing. Guard my heart. And I had to let out my heart be troubled. Because how many know when something like that happens, and if I did that, how many know that my results aren't going to be that great? My results are going to be rough. And so um, it was so funny because I, I was, uh, we were going to, uh, we were setting up the new, we have a new internet source of the church. It's going to be more stable. It's going to be better for live streaming. And um, we, uh, <laughs> anyway, we and John are working together on this day. And, uh, and so we were going to do that, and I couldn't find my wallet, but I, I let my heart be troubled, and uh, I kept peace on it, 
and eventually found it. You know how I found it? I called my wife. I said, amen. <laughs> hey, there's an entirely different sermon right there. So, you know, if you know your wife knows where it's at. Anyway, amen. Had an opportunity to do it. But, and, you know, we live in a world where uh, there's a real absence of peace. And God loves us so much that he wants us to live our lives out of a place of peace. And the thing about it is, the kingdom of God, folks, it runs on peace. Everything in the kingdom runs on peace. Now here's the thing, where's the kingdom at this morning? It's inside of you, right? And so, if everything that God does is through peace, then what's going to happen is, it would be good for us to live our lives out of a place of peace, so that we can be led by the Spirit. Amen? And God does not want us caught up in the franticness and the craziness of this chaotic world. He wants us to be able to live out of our hearts and be able to live out of a place of peace. Now, uh, in John 14, Jesus speaking here, he says, John 14 and verse 27, he says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, and neither let it be afraid. And so we see here, and this has been kind of our springboard verse, that Jesus has given us his peace. Amen? See, peace is not something that you are trying to get. Once you are saved, once you are born again, you already have peace. Peace has been given to you. Amen? One of the, one of the greatest attacks of the enemy is the devil tries to, to make you strive to be what you already are. And you got to watch that. The enemy's always trying to get you to strive and to try harder to be something that you already are. And the gospel works the opposite. Jesus came to you and he made you something. He made you the righteousness of God. He made you a child of God. He gave you his peace. The kingdom is within you. You're not trying to become something. You're not trying to get somewhere. You're not trying to strive to accomplish what Jesus has already done for you, which places you in a place of rest. How did, how did he uh, tempt Adam and Eve? Well, he tempted them to try to get them to do something to make them become something they already were. I mean, you know, they were already like God. They were already the children of God. He said, if you eat this, you will be like God. And how I many you know as they strove to become something that they already were, they lost it. And so the, the, the understanding is that faith is always going to bring a rest into your life. It's always going to bring um, a, a dialing down. It's always going to bring a confidence. I mean, you know, if someone is not confident in something, they're always trying to prove to everybody that they are something. Christians have been plagued with that. God doesn't want you running around trying to prove anything to anybody. God wants you to rest in what he's already done for your life. And in doing that, it will be easier for you to act like you are. For example, my dog has no insecurity about being a dog. <laughs> When it's time for him to go use the restroom, he goes, he hikes his leg, he uses the restroom. He marks his spot, he smells stuff. If he, if he wants to dig, he digs. If he wants to bark, he barks. He has no identity crisis. <laughs> he does not wake up one morning and think, am I a dog? Am I really a dog today? You know what? I don't feel like a dog today. Maybe I'm not a dog. Oh my gosh, I'm not a dog. I know my dog has to deal with that. I don't know Christians do that. Christians, Christians deal with that uh, challenge of identity. But here's the thing. How do you know my dog never ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? And so he has no conscience in which to condemn him for his behavior. He has no conscience in which to prick him about what he's doing right and what he's doing wrong. In a dog's life, there is no good and evil. Because he's in a place of innocence. Are you tapping me here? And so, but with Christians, we've been born again. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. And now God wants to bring a rest and a security in our lives that God loves us and that we have peace. Amen? 
And so Jesus has given us his peace. And we, we looked at this a little bit last week. And the peace that Jesus has given us is right standing with God. I mean, there was never a time before the cross when Jesus questioned whether God was for him or not. Jesus never questioned if God was for him. You know why? Jesus knew with solid confidence that no matter what, God was for him. When the storm arose, Jesus didn't question his standing with God. When Lazarus died, Jesus didn't question his standing with God. When Jairus came and his daughter was sick, Jesus didn't question his standing with God. If you'll look at Jesus' life, he walked in peace. He lived his life out of a place of peace. He never got rushed. He never got hurried. He never freaked out. He was confident in his relationship with God. And the reason he was confident in his relationship with God is he never sinned. Jesus did not have to deal with condemnation because he never sinned. Now here's the thing. How many know Jesus fulfilled the law? Jesus was the only one born of a woman who could go to the old covenant and say, I have kept it. I fulfilled this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. And they would come to him and say, have you come to destroy the law? He said, no, no, no. I've not come to destroy the law. I've come to fulfill the law. And so Jesus lived 33 and a half years on this planet, never sinned, fulfilled the law entirely, never sinned. So how do you know that he had confidence and he had right standing before God? But here's the thing. Did Jesus earn his own righteousness? He did not. I mean, no, Jesus was born righteous. Notice he was born of a virgin. He was born without sin, right? You know whose righteousness he earned? Our righteousness. He earned our righteousness. How did he do that? He fulfilled the law. And then not only did he fulfill the law, he paid the penalty for everyone that could not. Are you tracking me? Jesus never doubted his identity. And notice when the devil came to tempt him, the temptation was in the area of identity. If you be the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. He was The devil was trying to get Jesus to act for him. He was trying to get Jesus to do for him. If you're really the Son of God, then turn these stones into bread. I mean, no, Jesus could have turned the stones into bread, but he did not. Why? He was confident in who he was, listen to me, and he did not have to prove anything to the devil, and he did not have to prove anything to anybody else, because he knew who he was, and he knew that he had right standing with his Father. Amen? Now, when you have received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you have been given the gift of his righteousness. How many of you know this morning, as a born-again believer, you are no longer standing in your righteousness. You are standing in Jesus' righteousness. So the same, how many of you know Jesus came to bring peace? Emmanuel, God with us. And so the same righteousness that Jesus had, he has given to us, to where now, I mean, if you're right with God, you have peace. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to declare to you, today you are right with God. Why are you right with God? Because you believe in Jesus. And it is Jesus that makes you right with God. The old covenant law proved that man could not make himself right with God because man could not perform enough right acts to change his identity. Are y'all tracking me here? And so your peace begins in the place of this. You know that God is for you. Was God for Jesus? Where are you at today? You're in Jesus. You know what that means? That means that God is for you. Can I get an amen? And if God is for you, then who can be against you? Nobody in this room questions that we have a big, powerful God that can handle any problem that comes before us. What we question is, what the enemy tries to get us to question is, is will God do it for us? Right? Now the answer is yes. Because all the promises in him are yes and amen. Again, amen. You know that you don't earn God's promises? 
Do you know that you don't earn God's favor? You don't earn anything from God. It's all too, too expensive. We can't afford it. So God must pay for it himself and give it for free. <laughs> and that's what he did through Jesus. And so this morning, the same peace that Jesus had in his earthly walk is the same peace that we have with God because Jesus has given us his righteousness and Jesus has given us his peace. Isn't it good news? And so then it goes on in Romans 14, 17. We're just reviewing right now. It says, The kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's, that's the way the kingdom operates. Now, you as a child of God, because you've received Jesus as Lord and Savior, you have been made righteous through the blood of the Lamb. And because you've been made righteous through the blood of the Lamb, it has provided for you peace. Now listen, the entire kingdom of God within you is going to operate out of peace. God will lead you in paths of peace. You remember, we talked about this last week. This is why a lot of Christians don't know how to be led by the Spirit because they're not established in the new covenant. Because here's the thing. How I many of you ever had a time when you were about to do something and you didn't have peace about it? You know what that is? That's the kingdom of God within you leading you. Don't go down that road. Don't go down that path. Anybody ever experienced that before? That's the best way God leads. God leads us in his word and God leads us by his spirit. And ladies and gentlemen, the enemy can fake a lot of things, but he can't fake peace. He can't do that. He doesn't have the ability to do that. You're, we're not led by fleeces in the new covenant. We don't lay out a fleece and say, God, if this happens, you want me to do this or you don't. Can you do that with God? You can, but that's not the way God intends. How many of the devil can, can, can fake all kinds of stuff? Signs and wonders and all kinds of stuff. We're not chasing after those things. Amen? We look to Jesus. Will signs and wonders happen? Yes. Will God speak in visions and dreams? Yes. Will you hear the still small voice? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. God, God loves like that. But the number one way you're led in the spirit is by the presence or absence of peace. Because can't nobody fake that. And if you don't have peace about something, don't do it. That's God loving you and protecting you. Now here's the thing. Most Christians don't have peace already. And so they don't know when there's an absence of peace. And the reason they don't have peace is they don't believe that God is for them. And they think God is mad at them. And they think God is disappointed in them. And if people feel that way, now here's the thing. If you feel that way, you're wrong. <laughs> and that's a lot. Because here's the thing. When in the Old Covenant... When, when the sinner brought the lamb before the priest, did the, did the priest inspect the sinner? No. He inspected the lamb. And if the lamb was without spot, without blemish, then the innocence of the lamb was transferred to the sinner, and the sin of the sinner was transferred for the, to the lamb, and the sin was covered. Right. I mean, no, we're not under that anymore. Let me ask you a question. Is your lamb without spot? Yes. Which, is your lamb without blemish? So when God looks at you, he's not necessarily looking at you and your mistakes. He's looking at Jesus in his perfection. Right. Can I get an amen? amen? So God doesn't want us to be self-conscious and self-focused and self-examining and introspective. God wants us Jesus-focused, Jesus-examining, and looking at him. Because the Bible says, as he is, so are we in this world. Amen? And so that's good news, isn't it? Well, it's the gospel. Amen. I think that we're coming to a time on planet Earth when the only good news we're going to hear is the gospel. And it's okay. And it's okay. There's all kinds of good things happening, but people make less money when they when they talk about good things. People make more money when they scare people. Oh well. Amen. My kingdom's not of this world. Amen. We we don't belong in this world, we belong in the next. Now and so with that, let's turn to 1 Corinthians 14. And it's sad how a lot of times man-made religion has mirrored the world's way of doing things. And we're going to hit that right now this morning. Because everything God does, he's the God of peace. He's going to lead you into peace. See, I think it's sad when a minister gets up and they, put, they pressure someone to do something when God leads in peace. You know, anytime someone's pressuring you and putting you on a timetable to do something, I question it. You ever been had pressure sales? 
man, we were trying to buy a car a couple years ago or something, and this brother's would come after me, <laughs> and I would shut him down. <laughs> because I'm not going to be pressured into anything. I love you. I'll buy a car from you if I feel like it's the right one. But if you have to pressure me into it, then you can forget it. I mean, the world operates on pressure. The kingdom of God does not. And I can't tell you how many times I've seen ministers get up and pressure people to give. Like if they don't give right now, then somehow the blessing's not going to be there. Because God is, is you know, God is, you know, it's, it looks more like the jackpot. Mm -hmm. And then the church, you know, I've got to give now, I've got to give now. If you want to build a rock, no, 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 no. God will lead you. You don't need somebody pressuring you. How many know a good shepherd leads? A good shepherd does not beat or pressure. How many know Jesus is the good shepherd? And how many know God is raising up good shepherds? Mm -hmm. Amen. We, we've had a lot. We've had a lot of the wrong, and uh, we're in the midst of a reformation, and God is making things right. Amen. Amen. And He's always going to lead us in peace. Now, in First Corinthians fourteen thirty three makes a very important statement about God and the way He does things. First Corinthians chapter fourteen verse thirty three: For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. Now here's the thing, God does not operate in confusion, God does not uh, do anything in confusion. Now that word confusion in the Greek um, is Strong's number 181, and it's the word octasia, and it means confusion, disorder, from instability. From instability. Confusion or disorder because of instability. Now, says God's, God is the author of peace, not of confusion and instability. Now, here's the challenge. Christians, as a whole, have been unstable in here. And because they have been unstable and there's been an absence of peace, now, here's the thing. It's easier to control someone who's afraid. It's easier to control someone who's afraid. It's easier to control someone who is afraid. And many times what man-made religion has done is they scared God's people into submission so that they could control them and live their lives for them and tell them what they're supposed to do right and tell them what they're supposed to do and how they're going to live their lives. Now, here's the thing. How I many know that's not the way God operates? God operates out of peace. And that instability, I mean, you know, it's easier to control someone who's insecure. It's easier to control someone who does not have confidence. Now, here's the thing. The gospel comes to bring peace in people's hearts so that they're not controlled outwardly by a man or a ministry or a person, but they are led by the Spirit of God in here. Can I get an amen? You know, a lot of the mistakes that have been made are a result of people not having a relationship with God for themselves. The people having their relationship with God through the pastor. Yeah. Or through the leader or the minister. Ladies and gentlemen, we're not, that's not the New Testament. You're not supposed to have your relationship with God through the minister. Where if the minister uh, likes me, then that means God <laughs> likes me. The minister approves me, that means I'm approved by God. Sweetheart, your approval with God has nothing at all to do with the minister. It has everything to do with Jesus Christ. When you believe in Jesus Christ and you receive him as Lord and Savior, God is well pleased with you because you have honored the work of his son. Now whether the minister likes you or doesn't like you, approves you or doesn't approve you, that has nothing to do with your relationship with God and your standing with God. Can I get an amen? Yeah. And I know this really attacks the foundation of, of man-made legalism religion, but ladies and gentlemen, it can't be that way. The minister is to point to Jesus. The minister is to preach the gospel, which will produce peace, which will allow people to hear God for themselves. Yeah. The minister is not a mediator. The minister is not a go-between. You have Jesus inside of you right now. The purpose of the minister is to bring fresh bread that's going to feed the people of God so that they can renew their minds and they can have their own relationship with God outside of a church service. 
See, your relationship with God, you can, we come here to learn and to feed, but ultimately we need our relationship out there. We need to be led by God's Spirit out there. We need wisdom out there. We need Jesus out there. I mean, you, know, you can't have your pastor in your back pocket 24 hours a day. And what ends up happening a lot of times is people are accountable as long as there's a person to be accountable to, but when they're alone, there's no accountability because they've not developed their own relationship with God. You don't want your accountability to be to a man or a woman or a minister or a leader. You want your accountability to be to the Lord Jesus Christ. And here's the thing. Wherever you're at, he's with you. True maturity, when we, be, when we, when we begin to be, it's not what we do when everybody's watching. It's what we do when people are not watching. Can I get an amen? And that's what the gospel produces. It produces the reality of the kingdom on the inside of us. And God is not the author of confusion. Let's look to look to Luke chapter 12, verse 1. I'm going to read to you uh, this verse out of the Amplified because it really kind of captures the heart of what's going on. Anytime there is legalism, there will always be fear. And what the righteousness, which is a faith, does is it destroys legalism. See, legalism always looks to set up a hierarchy. Yeah. Legalism always looks to say, these people are more right with God than these people. And these people are more right with God than these people. And it's generally where you sit at in church, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. This person is the most right with God. And this per these, these are, they're right with God a little less, a little less, a little less, a little less, a little less. You follow me? Garbage. Okay? There is no one in this room that's any better than anybody else. There is no one in this room that has more of a right to God than anyone else. The only reason I can preach is God gave me a gift. I did not earn it. I do not deserve it. He gave me a gift. Amen? Everything that comes from God is a gift. It's not something that is earned. Amen? And so... Legalism sits, looks to set up a hierarchy and looks to set up a pyramid system. Go ahead and hit it one time. You can make all kinds of money through people's sin consciousness. You can build huge buildings. You can have all kinds of things if you'll make people feel guilty enough that they have to give and to serve to be right. I'd, I'd, I'd rather die than do that. I want truth. I do not want wood, hay, and stone. Right. Amen. And, 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 and the reality is, Jesus is not in the pyramid schemes. How many of the Pharisees and Sadducees? They were the most holy. They were up here. Had their white robes and had their degrees and had all their outward stuff. And they acted like they were better than the people. And when the true Christ came, they crucified him because they were offended. You know what was offended? Their self-righteousness and their pride. Sometimes I think the church at large can have a, a much raunchier pride than the world ever thought about it. Yeah. And Jesus Christ did not die so that we could be prideful and think that we were better than other people. Jesus came and died so we could recognize we all need a Savior and nobody's any better than anybody else. Can you get an amen? And, and that's one of the reasons that love has been so frustrated in the church worldwide is people have been set up in a, in a legalistic concept of righteousness which prevents love from flowing. If I think I'm better than somebody else, can I love them? No, I can't. Anything that's directed towards them is condescending. See, the Bible says that we are to lift each other up and esteem each other better than ourselves. And, that goes, and that's everybody. Can you get an Amen. How I many of you know we are supposed to honor the pastor? How I many of you know we're supposed to honor each other? Yeah. It's funny how people want to preach, honor the pastor, honor the pastor, honor the pastor, honor the pastor. And then, the, and then God love the saints, man, they're out there just trying to fight for the pastor's approval. When the reality is we're all supposed to honor each other. And submit to one another and love each other, amen? But we cannot do that where legalism is and self-righteousness is and man-made religion is. And let's look at the scripture, Luke chapter 12, verse 1. I'm reading out of Amplified. In the meanwhile, where so many thousands of the people had gathered that they were trampling on one another, Jesus commenced by saying primarily to his disciples, be on your guard against the leaven, the ferment of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy, 
producing unrest and violent agitation. Now, what he's talking about there, that leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. How many know when you do something outwardly that's different than what's in your heart, it's a lie? Yeah. That's what true hypocrisy is. God's not concerned with how you look in front of other people. God's concerned with what's in your heart. Religion is concerned with how you look in front of other people and who cares about your heart. <clears throat> and so what legalism does is it automatically brings unrest. What are you talking about, Jeremiah? Let me, let me, let me switch gears here for just a second. If I came out preaching a message that your right standing with God was based upon your behavior and not upon your Savior, right. it would immediately cause all of you to begin to doubt your salvation, cause you to be afraid, and cause you to work harder to please me. And so it would take away your peace that Jesus died to provide for you and it would place in your heart unrest and it put a ring in your nose that you could be drug around with. And in the 1500s, when we had the Reformation with Martin Luther, it was the, the, the issue was salvation. Remember how they would teach, you know, if you just give enough, then you can be saved. And if you give enough, you can get your family out of, of hell and stuff like that. Well, today we don't deal with that as much. Today what we deal with is the promises of God. People want to say, well, you can be here, you this, and you got to do this, and you got to do this. Or you can be prospered, but you got to do this, and you got to do this, and you got to do this. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus is tossing the temple tables, and he is, re he is removing the price tax from his promises, and he is declaring to the entire world his promises are for free because he paid for them. And it's ticking a whole lot of people off. But oh well. Truth generally does. Yeah. Amen. And how many know he cleansed the temple at the beginning of his ministry and the end of his ministry? And how, do you think he'll cleanse the temple before his return? I think so. And that's what he's doing right now. And that's what this grace revolution is about. See, a lot of the attacks is not the it's not an issue of sin. People say, well, grace gives people a license to sin. Hmm, that's not in the Bible. Yeah. Romans six fourteen says that grace gives you a license to be free from sin. Many times the issue is not sin. The issue is money. Hate to say it, but it's true. The issue is money. If you can't scare people into giving, then what in the world will make them give? Well, they might have for God and hear from God. If you got to scare people and fear people into giving, you don't believe God. <coughs> is it not true? It is true. If you've got to pressure manipulate somebody to do something, you're not trusting God. You're trusting your ability to control the situation. To ministers, if you'll just preach the gospel, God will take care of the finances. Because there is a blessing on the gospel. It's the truth. You cannot manipulate people and trust God at the same time. Can't do it. You know, God's not called you to live based on your checklist, and He's not called you to live based on someone else's checklist. He's called, Jesus has ripped up your checklist and said you're qualified, right where you're at, because of the work of the cross. Amen. And so it provides you with peace where you can begin to operate out of the kingdom of God and not the strivings of man. But religion as a whole, they've not known a lot of peace because they haven't been confident in the cross and they were more confident in the things that they did than what Jesus did. It's astonishing how good legalism can look outwardly, but how completely horrendous it is inwardly. You cannot do what Jesus did. Either Jesus did it and accomplished it and you're right with God, or you are left with the burden of being your own Messiah. Legalism is anti-Christ theology. It does not honor Jesus. It honors self. It is humanism with a different t-shirt and a different bumper sticker. True. It's not about what we can do. It's about what we did. It's about us enjoying it. Amen? Now, Romans 10 and... Um, Let's take a look here 
at a couple of verses because it's astonishing how zealous legalism can make people. But it's always for the wrong reasons. Romans 10 and verse 1, Paul speaking here, talking about the religious Jews of the day. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness, they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness <laughs> have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Now here's the thing. What is, what, what is the root of, uh, of man-made legalistic religious activity? It's people trying to establish their own righteousness. You cannot do anything to make yourself right with God. It's very insulting to pride. Very insulting to flesh. You can't do it. If you could do something to make yourself right with God, there would have been no reason for Jesus to die. Right? Okay? Jesus fulfilled the law, completed it, and now Jesus has given you the gift of his righteousness. He that knew no sin became sin so that we could become the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. And so now you've been made the righteousness of God, but now God, what God wants you to do is to submit to his righteousness. How do you submit to his righteousness? You declare, I am forgiven. I am the righteousness of God. God is not mad at me. God is madly in love with me. And all the promises are yes and amen to me. Amen. Because of Jesus. But what, what legalism tries to do is it tries to get you to establish your own righteousness. Well, you're right with God if you do this. And you're right with God if you do that. And you're right with God if you do this. And you're right with God if you do that. What we have, we have people running around in confusion and instability trying to serve God to get something that the cross has already provided for free. So what happens is you got Christians freaked out, <laughs> knocking on doors, trying to witness to people. Because they think their salvation is based on their ability to tell people about Jesus. Right. So what happens is when they're telling people about Jesus, they're not telling people about Jesus because they love them. They're telling people about Jesus because they want to selfishly rack up enough points. Mm. To earn God's favor. Yeah, you're right. And so, but what God wants to do is he wants to say time out on all of that. And he wants us to be seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, relaxing God's love and know this, you are right with God. And you know what it does to me? It, and it does to you. It brings us into a place of rest and peace. And now the kingdom of God can really begin to operate. And God can, out of that place, lead you to do the things you used to do for the wrong reasons. Then all of a sudden, those works that you do, listen to me, they're no longer dead works. They become good works because they are filled with love and not filled with fear. Yes, that's exactly right. And then all of a sudden, your service to God is no longer wood, hay, and stone. Your service to God is silver, gold, and precious jewels. And when the fire comes, it will not be burnt because everything that you're building will be built on the rock of Jesus Christ and not the rock of yourself. Amen. See, Jesus is that stumbling stone of offense. The cross is offensive. The cross says man cannot be right on his own. Man needs a savior. So we stumble at the stumbling stone, but then we stand upon that rock, and now we have nothing to be ashamed of. Because our trust is in him and not in ourselves. Y'all tracking me? And then all of a sudden it begins to bring this beautiful peace inside of your heart because Jesus is your savior. Jesus is your righteousness. Jesus is your sanctification. Jesus is your wisdom. Jesus is your redemption. He does it all. You enjoy it. But don't we have something to do? <clears throat> yes, you believe. You believe and everything else will take care of itself. 
I used to be the most aggressive evangelist. I mean, <coughs> crazy. I can, I mean, I could go on and on and on and on and on about all the stupid, zealous things I did with that knowledge that produced no fruit. It doesn't produce any fruit when it's for the wrong reasons. And now, as I'm arresting God's love and I have peace in my heart, I become an effective evangelist because I can only share what I already have. I already have peace. I'm not trying to get it. I'm not trying to deserve it. I already got it. Amen. And I'm confident in it. You know, there's some atheists trying to get me to argue with them the other day. <laughs> and I won't do it. And then what they try to do, they try to insult you enough to get your flesh to rise up. Yeah. That's what they do. Yeah. And he was in a public arena. He was on Twitter. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just, I said, look, man, I, I, and this is what I did. I never disrespected them. See, don't, don't let the enemy drag you into a poo-throwing fight. <laughs> <laughs> to, to, to throw poo, you must pick it up. <laughs> and then you got poo on your hands. And then there you are, the Christian, tossing poo. And all the unbelievers are looking at you like you ain't no different than the atheists. And what I did was, instead of disrespecting them and attacking them, I just, I, I loved on them, and I said, look, I said, I understand your viewpoint. You know, I was, I used to, I was an atheist, I was a drug addict, I was an alcoholic, but Jesus set me free. Mm -hmm. And their response was, well, good news for you is if you set yourself free, stop giving credit to your imaginary friends. Mm -hmm. Now, what's that? Well, here's the barb. What's it trying to do? It's trying to make me mad. Mm -hmm. But I'm not going to Here's the thing. I don't have to defend myself. Mm -hmm. I'm already justified. Mm -hmm. With or without his opinion of me, I'm justified. I don't need his approval. Mm -hmm. You know what it frees me up to do? I'm free for myself, so I don't have to defend my honor. You tracking me? And the only thing I said, I just said, look, I said, uh, you know, I used to feel that way. You know, my dad's an atheist. And, uh, you know, I, thank you for taking your time to share your viewpoint with me. I appreciate you taking time out of your day to share that. And then I said, God bless you and send him a smiley face. <laughs> what are they trying to do? They're trying to bait me into an argument. What's it going to take from me? Yeah. Enemies after your peace. And if he gets your peace, he's automatically got your joy. You don't need to spend your time fighting with people. Enjoy Jesus. Amen. Your, your salvation is not based on you sharing Jesus. Your salvation is based on the cross. Can I get an amen? And when the pressure comes off your shoulders, you'll share Jesus more by accident than you ever did trying so hard. <coughs> you know what I'm You know when people try really hard at something it's because they don't really believe it? A lot of times we're trying to convince people because we don't believe. The, the greatest confidence is from rest and peace. See, whether that those people believe it or not, I know Jesus is real. And the best thing I can do for them is just love them and not fight with them. I mean, I could have spent an hour and a half fighting with them. You know what would have happened? Nothing. Who on my hands, who on their hands, and the people that are watching are like, ah, Christianity, this is another religion. There's people fighting about who's right and who's wrong. Love wins. Love never loses. But it begins by knowing that we're loved and having peace in that place. Yeah. You know? Now, let's turn to James three. We've got a couple more places here and we close. Thank you, Lord, for maintaining the rain. Thank you, Andrew, for checking the door. James chapter three. And we're going to see something very interesting. I know that the world has a wisdom. There is a worldly wisdom. And the worldly wisdom is not the same as a godly wisdom. James chapter 3, and let's take a look at verse 13. It says, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, and demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. 
Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace with those who make peace. Now let's look back here at verse 14. It says that you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts. So let me ask you a question. What are the two of the primary traits of man-made religion? Jealousy and self-seeking. My agenda. Those are two of the major things that you see in most churches. You see people jealously trying <coughs> to get position, trying to get approval, and people trying to um, and trying to basically fulfill their own interests. Is that not a, one of the marks of a lot of religion? Now, interestingly enough, that's not the way God does things. I mean, you know, God doesn't operate like that. But here's the thing. When righteousness is based on men and not based on Jesus, men will always try to scramble and be better than another man. And try to compete and try to be good enough. I mean, you know, there's no room for jealousy and competition in the kingdom of God. Thank you, amen. It's just the truth. Jealousy and competition arises out of insecurity and a lack of trust towards God. How many know God has enough blessing to, to go around? How many know God has enough approval to go around? How many know God has enough righteousness to go around? Do you think the blood is enough to cover us all and to cleanse us? It is, isn't it? And so when legalism is presented, it will always produce an atmosphere of jealousy and competition and self-seeking, which places the pastor in a position to manipulate people. I can manipulate this person because they want this position. I can manipulate this person because they got this. They're trying to get this. And, and then the pastor, instead of being a one that presents bread and feeds, becomes one that holds the reins of everyone's life. And the entire thing is just as ugly as it can be, and it's no different than, 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 than corporate America. It's no different than the way the world does things. Amen. I know it's so ugly. Once you start taking the blanket off of it, it's like, ugh, it's ugly. I've been in the middle of that. And what happens is, no one has peace. No one ever has peace because no one ever feels like they've done enough. And what happens is, you get, it, it, there's a lot of, basically, witchcraft going on. What is witchcraft, Jeremiah? Is it potions and spells and cauldrons? Not really. Witchcraft is, is manipulating people and making them do what you want to do through your emotions. And it's a work of the flesh. It's not some crazy spiritual thing. It's just flesh. And, and witch, witchcraft is rooted in not trusting God. Trusting self. So how many of you know people can be manipulative through being domineering? How many of you know people can be manipulative through making people pity them? There's all different types of manipulation. And here's the thing. Manipulation does not trust God. Manipulation trusts self. What was Saul's greatest problem? Saul did not trust God. Saul trusted himself. And we know he eventually uh, went to the witch of Endor. That's where that thing ends up. It's a gross thing. How many know David did not trust himself? David trusted God. And David waited on the Lord to provide what he what God gives you, nobody can take away from you. What man gives you, you have to, man can take away from you. And what you manipulate to obtain, you have to manipulate to maintain. <clears throat> what you receive from God is a gift, you receive it, and nobody can take it away from you. Amen. Yeah. It's true, isn't it? And what it does is it, is it, it, it sets you free from allowing the enemy to control you to control other people. Right. I mean, the devil try he's a flesh devil, he works through flesh. And he's always trying to get in there and do his thing. God's kingdom does not operate like that. God's kingdom, and see, those things can't happen where Jesus is in the center. That's why the gospel's got to be preached. If your righteousness is from Jesus, do you have to compete to be more right with God? No. Do you have to compete for the pastor's approval? You have to compete for nothing. It's all yours. And you already have it. Thank you, amen. And it silences the enemy's attacks, and that's why the enemy hates the gospel. It is the power of God unto salvation. Amen. And so, in verse 15, it says, This wisdom does not descend from above, 
but is earthly, sensual, demonic, for where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. You see the difference between uh, the enemy's kingdom and God's kingdom? God's kingdom operates out of a place of peace. And as that wisdom comes forth, I mean, no, you don't have to be scared there's not going to be enough. You don't have to be afraid of that. God takes care of his children. Amen. Amen. Don't be afraid. Don't listen to the world. You don't know what's going on. They don't. God knows what's going on. You're going to be taken care of because you're his kids. Amen. And so here's the thing. What do you got to do? Yeah, let not your heart be troubled. Guard that peace. Don't let anybody take that peace from you. And the primary way the enemy attacks that peace is through making you feel like you're not right with God. All right. Are you so awesome of a screw up <laughs> that you can mess the cross up? <laughs> I know those are a little bit of strong language here, but sweetheart, don't be so egotistical as to think that you can mess the work of the cross up. The cross is greater than your mistakes. The cross is greater than your unbelief. See, this path of peace and this way of grace that God has provided, he prophesies about in Isaiah, fools cannot err therein. I am so thankful. I cannot mess this up. It is an invitation to all of the weak, the last and the lost. In the least, it says, come. The kingdom is open. You can have it all for free. Just don't take credit for it, any of it. Amen. I mean, the challenge with, with grace is you can't take credit for nothing. I'm so okay with that. Amen. I don't want credit. I didn't do nothing. I haven't done anything. I just received. I was saved. Amen. And, um, and so what's awesome is this shuts the devil down. And it dismisses him as accuser because he cannot accuse the blood. And it is the blood that has cleansed you. You are right with God. Don't let anything take your peace. Don't look at yourself. Look at your land. Don't look at your mistakes. Look at your Jesus. And as you look at your Jesus, your Jesus will fill your heart with peace. Because you know what? You don't have to qualify to be blessed. It is undeserved, unmerited favor. Can you get an amen? Is it good news? Does it sound too good to be true? Yeah. It's supposed to. If it does not sound too good to be true, then the gospel's not being preached. Because that's the nature of it. A couple more places as we close here. Let's turn to Galatians chapter 6. Y'all get anything out of this this morning? Yeah. Amen. Cool. Are we icing? Further north there, I'm going to shut it down. Let's shut it down. Let's shut it down. Love you guys. Thank you. Let the let me just we'll, we'll shut it down and we'll stop it right there. Can I pray real quick over you guys really? Because I was kind of feeling down here like we were done. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for the honor and privilege to hear the good news of the gospel. Lord, we receive every good thing that you have for us based on Jesus and not on ourselves. Lord, I just speak a blessing. Lord, I think these people are safe and protected. They operate in wisdom. Everybody gets home safely, and all the food that they eat during this time will not be calories counted against them. <laughs> in Jesus